embark upon our first full committee markup of the new Congress. This committee is an ideas factory with the results to show for it. We racked up an impressive bipartisan record of success in the 113th Congress. Over 90 bills passed in the House and over 50 bills now law to promote jobs, modernize government, protect families and communities. Today we will consider a half dozen bills as we look to build upon that solid foundation of results. First, we have H.R. 734, the FCC Consolidated Reporting Act of 2015. It is authored by Majority Whip Scalise, Communications and Technology Subcommittee Chairman Walden, and Ranking Member Eshoo. This good government legislation reduces the reporting workload and increases efficiency at the FCC by consolidating eight separate congressionally mandated reports on the communications industry into a single comprehensive report. The streamlined report will give us important information about competition among technology platforms and the deployment of communications technologies to unserved communities. Next, H.R. 212, the Drinking Water Protection Act. It is authored by Representative Bob Latta. This bill will give the EPA the tools they need to prevent future occurrences like the one that happened in Ohio. As the Cleveland Plain Dealer editorialized yesterday, this bill recognizes the urgency of addressing the public health threat presented by harmful algal blooms. H.R. 471, the Ensuring Patient Access to Effective Drug Enforcement Act, one that I have authored in partnership with Representatives Marino, Welch, and Chu, would help prevent prescription drug abuse. It is an issue that hits home for all of our communities. The bill will establish clear and consistent enforcement standards and ensure patients have access to medications by promoting collaboration among government agencies, patients, and industry stakeholders. H.R. 639, the Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act, authored by Health Subcommittee Chairman Pitts, Subcommittee Ranking Member Green, and Full Committee Ranking Member Pallone, would amend the CSA to improve and streamline the Drug Enforcement Agency's process for scheduling new drugs approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And last, the committee will consider two trauma bills led by Doc Burgess and Ranking Member Green. H.R. 647, the Access to Life-Saving Trauma Care for All Americans Act, reauthorizes language from the Public Health Service Act to aid hospitals in handling their uncompensated care costs from traumatic injury. The funding is set to expire in fiscal year 2015. All of us are concerned about level one and level two trauma centers, and we are pleased to have the bill before us. H.R. 648, the Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care Reauthorization Act, was passed through the full house in June 2014 and would help support state and rural development of trauma systems. For a modernizing government, for the innovation era to protecting public health, these are all important bills. And I would like to submit for the record a letter from the chain drugstores supporting HR 471, the Ensuring Patient Access to Effective Drug Enforcement Act. With that, I yield back the balance of my time, and I now recognize my friend from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you. I want to uh, thank the chairwoman. Uh, today we will consider a, a number of bills which all pass their respective subcommittees, and I want to thank our ranking members for their leadership as well as the staff who have collaborated along the way to ensure consensus. Over the years, Congress has tasked the FCC with compiling many individual reports about different sectors of the communications marketplace, and these reports provide the public and policymakers the insight we need to better understand the market. Nonetheless, we have a bipartisan interest in rationalizing these requirements and allowing the agency to use its resources more efficiently. To accomplish this goal, the Communications and Technology Subcommittee reached an agreement last week to update the FCC Consolidated Reporting Act. Together, we were able to find a way to preserve transparency for consumers and maintain the FCC's authority. Uh, two more bills uh, relate to uh, 
trauma, the traumatic injury, well, since now traumatic injury is the leading cause of death for children and adults under the age of 45, it's critical that states are equipped to deliver uh, medical services for traumatic injury. And that's why with the leadership of Mr. Green and Dr. Burgess, we're considering two bills that reauthorize a number of important trauma programs. The first, the Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care Reauthorization Act allows for planning and implementing trauma care systems in the states. The bill would also establish pilot projects for innovative models of regionalized trauma care. The second bill, the Access to Life-Saving Trauma Care for All Americans Act, reauthorizes two additional trauma programs that will increase the availability of trauma services. Our next bill is the Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act. It aims to bring better reliability and transparency to medical therapies while continuing to ensure that they reach patients in need quickly, but most importantly, safely and effectively. And the fifth bill, Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act, would help drug distributors, pharmacies, and others work with DEA to achieve the difficult balance between keeping controlled substance prescription drugs away from drug abusers, but not from patients who need them. And I'm glad that we've been able to work with both the DEA and the FDA, our Senate counterparts, and the bill sponsors to ensure that the goals of these bills are met. And the last bill is uh, H.R. 212, the Drinking Water Protection Act. I believe it's a step forward. Safe drinking water should be a bipartisan issue and should be a priority for this committee. Harmful algal blooms are a serious and growing threat to public health. They also carry serious economic impacts affecting fishing, recreation, and tourism. I'm happy to say that the bill will consider reflects several changes sought by Democratic members of the subcommittee. I thank the chairman, Mr. Ladd, and the majority staff for working with us to improve the bill. And I will add that not all of our changes were accepted, so the bill still lacks an authorization of appropriations. Without funding for implementation, I'm concerned that the strategic plan will have little impact. In addition, harmful algal blooms are just one of many threats facing our drinking water systems. More and more communities around the nation are experiencing the significant disruption that results when safe drinking water is suddenly not available. And serious threats include aging infrastructure, climate change, fracking, drought, and terrorism. The committee should be doing more to ensure access to safe and affordable drinking water, and we should be doing it in a bipartisan manner. I hope this bill will be the start rather than the end of our drinking water work. Uh, but Madam Chairwoman, I, I urge my colleagues to support passage of these bills today, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. At this time, I recognize Mr. Pitts for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Today we're considering four bipartisan health bills, but for the sake of time, I'll focus my remarks on H.R. 639, the Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act, which I introduced with ranking members Pallone and Green. H.R. 639, as amended, seeks to improve the transparency and consistency of DEA's scheduling of new FDA-approved drugs under the Controlled Substances Act, CSA, and its registration process for manufacturing controlled substances for use in clinical trials. Ultimately, this will allow new and innovative treatments to get to patients who desperately need them faster. This committee has worked diligently in the last several years to ensure that the FDA has the resources it needs to move new drugs more quickly through its approval process. However, newly approved drugs that contain substances that have not been previously marketed in the U.S. and that have abuse potential must also be scheduled under the CSA by the DEA before they can be marketed. Unfortunately, under the CSA, there is no deadline for the DEA to make a scheduling decision. And the delays in DEA decisions have increased nearly fivefold since the year 2000. And this bill would bring much needed certainty and predictability to the scheduling process and end the needless delays in patients' access to new therapies. So, I would urge all my colleagues to support these bills, and I yield back the remainder of my time. 
The gentleman yells back. At this time, Mr. Green is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate the committee's leadership for having this markup today. Of the bills that come out of the health subcommittee, all four address public health needs and remind us of what we can accomplish when we work together to improve the health and safety of the American people. H.R. 639, the Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Miracle Therapies Act, provides a solution to current delays experienced by patients in need. The amount of time the DEA has taken over before acting on the FDA recommendations has lengthened in recent years, which delays the availability of new therapies. This legislation will, will improve patient access by bringing clarity and transparency to the process of scheduling a new FDA-approved therapy. I was pleased to join Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member of the full committee, Frank Pallone, in supporting this legislation so we can continue the great work they started last Congress. Two other bills that are being marked up today are H.R. 648, the Trauma Systems and Regionalization Emergency Care Authorization Act, and H.R. 647, the Access to Life-Saving Trauma Care Act. My good friend and fellow Texan, Dr. Mike Burgess, and I are sponsors of these bills. H.R. 647 and 648 will reauthorize important grant programs that are designed to ensure the availability and effective use of trauma care. Trauma will continue to occur despite our best prevention efforts. Unfortunately, the access to trauma care is threatened by losses associated with high cost of treating severely injured patients, uncompensated care, and a growing shortage of trauma-related physicians. Investing in trauma centers and trauma systems will save lives, improve patient outcomes, and lead to cost savings within the healthcare systems. I want to thank Dr. Burgess for being a champion and partner on this effort. I also want to thank JP with Dr. Burgess' office and the committee staff for their hard work to move these bills forward. I also am a supporter of the environment and technology bills being considered today. Federal Communications Commission Consolidated Reporting Act, H.R. 734 is common sense bipartisan legislation that will eliminate outdated FCC studies and cons consolidate the remaining into a report that will focus on the current marketplace. I want to thank Chairman Shimkus for accepting many of the Democratic suggestions to the Drinking Water Protection Act, H.R. 212. Safe drinking water is a basic right for all Americans, no matter their income or where they live. I'll support this bill and hope the Environment Subcommittee will examine this important issue further over the next two years. I look forward to seeing these important pieces of legislation before, and I conti we continue to work in a bipartisan manner. I yield back for the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. And at this time, Mr. Bill Arrakis, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for allowing us to consider these very important bills. Today we will be looking at several bills. Most of them passed the House during the last session. Although the 113th Congress, uh, they died in the Senate, I'm glad we're starting this year with these bipartisan bills, and I'm hopeful that they will become law. There are four public health bills which builds on the bipartisan record of su uh, the success for this committee. Hospital trauma centers play an important role in our health care system. When we get into a severe accident, we all hope that we will be sent to a quality trauma center to handle our emergency. These trauma bills will help hospitals keep their trauma center funded and ensure quality care. The other two health bills deal with the Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, and controlled substances, which is a particularly important issue for my district. The Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act, HR 639, will have a DAA schedule uh, new drugs more quickly so these treatments can get to market faster. Delaying the scheduling of recent FDA-approved drugs only hurts patients who may need these breakthrough treatments. Lastly, H.R. 471, the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act, would provide better guidance and communication between pharmaceutical wholesalers and the DEA. We need to protect against prescription drug fraud while ensuring people in legitimate pain with legitimate uh, prescriptions have access to their medications. This legislation is a good first step. By providing drug wholesalers with a timely and accurate guidance, the DEA, pharmacists, and wholesalers will be able to work together and make substantive progress on this issue. As a new member of the Communications and Technology Subcommittee, I'm excited that we are quickly considering the Federal Communications Commission Consolidated Reporting Act, which has a long history of bipartisan support. 
oversight of the FCC is a significant task of this committee. It is essential that reporting requirements are tailored and consolidated to ensure efficiency and accountability. I'm pleased about the addition of the Communications Marketplace Report to this bill. This report focuses on the state of competition in the communications marketplace with an eye on combating barriers to entry and expansion. Such barriers disproportionately burden small and medium-sized businesses. This bill is a product of bipartisanship over the course of multiple Congresses. I hope it will stand as an early example of meaningful legislation produced by this committee when we put partisanship aside. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yells back, and at this time, Mr. Tonko from New York, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, tomorrow morning, we will report out H.R. 212, the Drinking Water Protection Act, authored by our colleague from Ohio, Representative Blotta. I want to thank Representative Blotta and Chairman Shimkus for working with us on this legislation. H.R. 212 addresses a serious drinking water problem that impacts human health, the environment, drinking water utilities, and many other businesses across our country, harmful algal blooms. This bipartisan bill is the result of the leadership of Representative Lata and Representative Kaptur and their desire to address the water quality problems of their area. Toledo, Ohio, made the headlines when the water utility had to shut down the water system for several days last year. But this problem is not unique to Lake Erie. H.R. 212 does not provide instant relief for the problem of harmful algal blooms but it does lay out a process for addressing the many facets of the problem. It is a good bill, and I urge our colleagues to support it. Communities large and small across this country are experiencing problems with their drinking water infrastructure. We have allowed the to-do list on drinking water systems to outpace the resources for getting these jobs done. This approach does not save money. It only leads to damage and expensive repairs. Those costs are inflicted on individual families, individual businesses, individual local governments, and certainly individual water utilities. H.R. 212 is a good beginning. I hope we will continue to work on these issues and address the many other outstanding problems with drinking water very soon. I look forward to working with Chairman Shimkus and all the members of our committee on other legislation so that we can meet our commitment to deliver clean and safe drinking water to every citizen. With that, I thank you. Madam Chair, and yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. And at this time, the author of H.R. 212, Mr. Latta, you are recognized for three minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I am pleased that the committee is marking up a bill I introduced, H.R. 212, the Drinking Water Protection Act. This bipartisan bill will put forth a strategic plan for assessing and managing risks associated with the cyanotoxins and algotoxins in drinking water provided by public water systems. Cyanotoxins and algotoxins in public drinking water produced from harmful algal blooms are presenting serious concerns for our nation's health. Last August, half a million people in the Toledo area, including many of my constituents, were unable to utilize their public drinking water for over two days without risking potentially negative health effects due to a high level of cyanotoxin microcystin LR detected in the city's water, public water supply. During that time, concerns and questions were and have since been raised about the health effects data, testing protocols, treatment processes, and appropriate short-term responses. Furthermore, witnesses before this committee have testified about further complexity of this issue due to the numerous other algotoxins and variants that may have potential negative health effects when present in public drinking water. I believe H.R. 212 takes the robust and strong scientific approach we need to protect the health and safety of our public drinking water and better understand this issue's short and long term. I am also pleased that we are marking up the FCC Consolidated Reporting Act, which would initiate much needed bookkeeping reforms at the FCC by modernizing existing law to reduce the agency's reporting workload. I urge my colleagues to support these bills as well as all the bills before the committee today. And Madam Chair, I thank you and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. At this time, are there any other statements from the Democrat side? The, um, none? All right. Dr. Burgess, you are recognized for three minutes. I thank the chair for the recognition and certainly want to thank uh, Chairman Upton and Ranking Member Pallone for holding the markup 
tomorrow, and I do plan on supporting all of the bills before our committee tomorrow. I also want to thank the committee for recognizing two bills relating to federal support for trauma care. As I mentioned at the subcommittee markup, trauma is the leading cause of death under the age of 65. It is expensive, costing over $400 billion per year. Over many years, uh, Ranking Member Green and I have worked closely on this issue to update the law and ensure reauthorization of crucial trauma grant programs, the Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care Reauthorization Act, H.R. 648, is identical to H.R. 4080, which passed the Full Energy and Commerce Committee unanimously last year. That bill later passed the House on a voice vote. This reauthorization allows funding for trauma systems development and for the regionalization of emergency care. Also, the Access to Life-Saving Trauma Care for All Americans Act, H.R. 647, will reauthorize two additional grants that expire this year. They provide critically needed fed, uh, funding to help cover uncompensated costs in trauma centers. Trauma centers must be available for all victims of traumatic injury. A study released last year found that patients living near a recently closed trauma facility were 21% more likely to die from their traumatic injuries. These bills draw wide support from organized medicine and the trauma community. I will enter those records in through the record at tomorrow's markup. I thank the gentlelady for the recognition. Yield back the balance of the time. The gentleman yells back. At this time, I recognize uh, Ms. Clark from New York for a request for a UC. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, on behalf of uh, Mr. Rush of Illinois, there's a motion at the table, uh, request uh, unanimous consent for the statement to be placed into the record. The gentleman's statement will be entered into the record. Okay. There are no other opening statements at the this time. The chair calls up H.R. 734 and asks the clerk to report. H.R. 734, to amend the Communications Act of 1934 to consolidate the reporting obligations of the Federal Communications Commission in order to improve congressional oversight and reduce reporting burdens. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered. For the information of members, we are now on H.R. 734. The committee will reconvene at 10 a.m., and I remind members that the chair will give priority recognition to amendments offered on a bipartisan basis. I look forward to seeing everyone at 10 a.m. And at this point, without objection, the committee stands in recess. The committee will come to order. At the conclusion of opening statements yesterday, the chair called up H.R. 734, and the bill was open for amendment at any point. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Seeing none, are there any other amendments? Seeing none. The question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 734 to the House. All those in favor so signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably reported. <laughs> Chair now calls up H.R. 639 as forwarded by the Subcommittee on Health and asks the clerk to report. H.R. 639 to amend the Controlled Substances Act with respect to drug scheduling recommendations by the Secretary of Health and Human Services and with respect to registration of manufacturers and distributors seeking to conduct clinical testing. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. The chair will recognize Mr. Pitts for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, DEA delays in scheduling. Wait, wait, the clerk you needs to report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 639 offered by Mr. Pitts. And without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. DEA delays in scheduling 
newly FDA-approved drugs are adversely impacting patients who need access to newly approved therapies. However, we have also heard from the DEA about their role in the scheduling process for newly approved medicines. My amendment attempts to strike the right balance. During its approval process, the FDA examines the abuse potential of the new drug and makes a scheduling recommendation to the DEA. Scientific and medical matters related to the scheduling recommendation are binding on the DEA, and over the last 15 years, the DEA has not made any scheduling decision for a new drug that was contrary to the FDA recommendation. However, DEA has raised concerns that under H.R. 639, the agency would no longer be able to provide its expertise in the process of scheduling a new drug before it can be marketed to patients. To address this concern, the amendment would allow for DEA to continue to conduct its own abuse liability analysis, but require the agency to schedule the new drug within 90 days of receiving FDA's recommendation or 90 days from FDA's approval of the drug, whichever comes later. DEA would have a meaningful opportunity to assess any potential diversion concerns while patients would have the peace of mind that the current open-ended process does not provide. Concerns have also been raised about the ambiguity of, in the law related to when a new drug's exclusivity and patent term restoration starts if it is subject to scheduling by DEA. The amendment today would clarify that for the subset of products that must be scheduled, these periods commence on the date a product can actually be marketed, just as it is for other new drug products. This bill is another example from this committee where we can work together in a bipartisan manner to help patients have timely access to new therapies. And I want to thank Ranking Member Pallone and Green for their partnership on this legislation and urge the support of all members. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? The chair will recognize the gentleman from New Jersey to offer an amendment to the amendment. That amendment is at the desk. And without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say very quickly, this is an amendment that makes a few technical corrections uh, to, to the amendment that Mr. Pitch just offered, and I would urge all of my colleagues to support it. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Are the other members wishing to speak on the amendment to the amendment? If not, the question occurs on the Plone Amendment to the Pitts Amendment. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The chair, the ayes have it. The, air, the ayes have it. The, the vote now occurs on the Pitts Amendment as amended by the Plone Amendment. Uh, all those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Amendment as amended is agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question now occurs on the bill as amended. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those who say no, and you chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is, favor is agreed to and favorably reported out of the committee. Chair now calls up H.R. 471 and asks the clerk to report. H.R. 471, to improve enforcement efforts related to prescription drug diversion and abuse and for other purposes. The, uh, without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Are there any, any amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 471 to the House. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the chair, the ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported. The chair now calls up H.R. 647 and asks the clerk to report. H.R. 647, to amend Title 12 of the Public Health Service Act to reauthorize certain trauma care programs and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? 
Are there any amendments to the bill? Uh, Mr. Chairman Burgess. Yes, I, I just moved to strike the requisite number of words. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. And I want to do that to thank you, Chairman Upton, uh, of course, Chairman Pitts on the subcommittee, Ranking Member Pallone, Ranking Member Green on the subcommittee. The two trauma bills, 647 and 648, are important, uh, both to Mr. Green and I, and I believe to members of the committee as well. It's an issue where we've worked closely together. We've got a long record of bipartisanship working toward uh, shoring up our nation's trauma systems and trauma centers. Trauma affects all individuals, of, uh, all individuals of all ages, 35 million Americans annually, one person every 15 minutes. At the subcommittee, I read a long list of supporting organizations. I do have letters of support representing this coalition, and I ask unanimous consent to enter all of them into the record. That objection. This legislation is broadly supported by medicine. The, uh, both bills are bipartisan. They've gone through regular order, both reported out of the health subcommittee. I want to thank the Energy and Commerce Committee staff on both sides of the dais, Clay Alspach, Katie Noveria, Adriana Simonelli, as well as Hannah Green. And with Mr. Green, I want to thank his staff, Kristen O'Neill. And finally, I want to thank J.P. Poliskevitz, who shepherded this bill through the process. I strongly urge the committee to support both of these bills. We look forward to their consideration by the House. And I'll be happy to yield back or yield to Mr. Green, whichever. Yield back. Chairman yields back. Are there other members wishing to speak? See none. The question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 647 to the House. All, all those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. You need a chair. The ayes have it. And the bill is favorably reported. Chair will now call up H.R. 648 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 648, to amend Title 12 of the Public Health Service Act to reauthorize certain trauma care programs and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Seeing none, are there any other amendments? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 648 to the House. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. And the bill is favorably reported. Chair now calls up H.R. 212 as forwarded by the Subcommittee on the Environment and the Economy and asks the clerk to report. H.R. 212, to amend the Safe Drinking Water Act to provide for the assessment and management of the risk of algal toxins in drinking water and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. Is there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Mr. A gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I want to make uh, move to strike the last word. Okay. But in this, I want to make reference to an amendment that was added onto the text of the bill and just uh, thank Mr. Latta for including that in. Uh, it's important that we allow and consult with private industry whose research and development has worked significantly with this and uh, not just the EPA information. Uh, for example, when they had the algae bloom off Lake Erie, uh, Bowling Green, Ohio, did not have uh, the water problem that Toledo did. And Bowling Green, for example, used activated charcoal uh, so they did not have that problem. That's an important thing we can learn from private industry. I want to thank uh, Mr. Latta for uh, who has shown tremendous leadership in this and including that in. And with that, I and also with Mr. Doyle for his support of this amendment as well. Thank you very much, Ayon. Gentleman yields back his time uh, again. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Seeing none. Question: Are there any amendments to the bill? Mr. Chair. Chair, I would recognize the gentleman from New York. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title. Which number is your amendment, sir? Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Wait, wait till the clerk reports the title of the amendment. Which number, sir? Um, I'm not certain. It's quite a Amendment to the committee print for H.R. 212 offered by Mr. Tonko of New York. After section two, add the following new section. Oh, section three, reauthorization of drinking water state revolving yes, fund. A, references except as otherwise specified whenever in this section 
an amendment is expressed in terms of an amendment to a section of other provision, the reference shall be considered to be made to a section or other provision to the Safe Drinking Water Act, 42 U.S.C. 300 F at SEC. Mr. Chairman. W w without objection, the title will be considered as read. Reserve point of order. And the gentleman from Illinois reserves a point of order, and the gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes in support of his. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My uh, amendment reauthorizes the Safe Drinking Water Revolving Loan Fund, the primary source of funding for state and local governments to maintain and upgrade their drinking water systems. The amendment authorizes the SRF for three years, beginning in 2016 with $1.2 billion and rising to $1.6 billion in 2018. The amendment also includes a section authorizing funds to provide technical assistance and support for rural and small water systems. The authorization is for $20 million per year for four years. Small communities with their limited rate base operate on extremely tight budgets. They constantly struggle to comply with safe drinking water standards and maintain drinking water infrastructure for the people that they serve. Mr. Chair, we have been seriously underfunding infrastructure maintenance and repair for water treatment and delivery systems. I know there are those who will say we cannot afford to do more. Nonsense is my response. Not only can we afford uh, afford it, we cannot afford to delay this any longer. It makes no financial sense to continue to allow critical infrastructure to deteriorate. It seems every week there is another report of a water main break in one or more drinking water systems. They happen across the country, every state, every region, not just in the district I represent. They happen in small communities and in major cities. Last year, Los Angeles, California experienced a water main break that sent 8 million gallons of treated treated water spilling across the University of California campus and creating a 15-foot hole in Sunset Boulevard. This past week in my district, the city of Amsterdam experienced a water main break. Water spilled down into the street where it froze into a sheet of ice, making driving treacherous and walking in the area very dangerous. It isn't just the water leaking from those pipes. It's money, our money, money spent treating the water, money spent to respond to the emergency, money spent to patch and replace the pipe, money spent to repair the other infrastructure that is damaged by the sudden flooding, money spent by businesses and homeowners to deal with flooded basements, water shutoffs, and other damage to their businesses and personal property. We have programs to advise third world nations on how to build and maintain drinking water infrastructure. We tell them all about the value of clean water for public health purposes and economic development. We need to take our own advice. Water is not a luxury. It is a necessity. Any area that expects to attract business and retain residents must have functioning, reliable drinking water infrastructure. I do appreciate the bill that Representative Lotta has brought to our committee. I certainly intend to support it. But we also need to go further. We need to address the backlog of infrastructure repair and replacement projects that exist across this country that have rendered us a third world nation at times. I know I am not alone in this concern. We've heard from water utilities, associations of civil engineers, and the people in our districts who are struggling to cope with these problems. We know what we need to do. Now we need to just simply do it. Let's not continue to waste water and money. Let's do what is required. Let's fix the systems that sustain us. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Do you want, do you want to talk about it? Let's speak on this. Hmm? you want to speak? Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, Chair will recognize the uh, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to indicate my support for the Tonko Amendment. Uh, our water infrastructure is in a dangerous state of disrepair, and most of it has been determined to be at or beyond the end of its useful life. Every time EPA has assessed our drinking water infrastructure needs, the needs have gone up significantly, and industry estimates are even higher. The American Water Works Association has estimated that it will take more than $1 trillion in investment in water infrastructure over the next 25 years to sustain delivery of clean and safe water. And time and again, we've heard testimony that greater investment in drinking water infrastructure is desperately needed. Just last week at the Environmental Subcommittee's hearing on this bill, witnesses representing EPA, water utilities, and state drinking water administrators all expressed support for reauthorization of the drinking water state revolving fund and increasing the amount of available monies. I just want to stress, I, I, we just can't keep taking clean water for granted. 
Providing the American people with safe drinking water is a fundamental duty of the government, and we can't do that without investing in our infrastructure. This, an amend this amendment is an important step towards helping public water systems continue to deliver safe, affordable drinking water to the American people, and I hope we can work together on this issue. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. And does Mr. Shimkus still insist on this point of order? Um, yes, I do. Uh, gentleman insists on this point of order. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on the point of order briefly? I, would, I think that uh, due to the germaneness issue, I would just ask that you withdraw the amendment. I, I hear the um, request to withdraw the amendment. I would like to get a commitment that the committee would work on this issue. We would love to work with you to develop a sound program that responds to the communities across this country. It's a tremendous resource that is required for a modern society. We can't bury our heads in the sand any longer. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah, as, as my friend, the ranking member of the subcommittee knows, that we have already, at which you have agreed to attend a meeting with Mr. Harper to start, start talking about some of these issues. I would hope that you and, and he will have a, a great uh, discussions and that you can bring through the committee something that's worthy of the subcommittee and the full committee. So we look forward. I mean, you're very passionate. We appreciate that passion. Uh, no one disregards the, uh, the, the challenges this nation faces on this issue. But I would encourage you to continue to work with Mr. Harper, and we, hopefully uh, we can get yeah. something uh, out. That's good. Well, I, I hear that, and I respect that, and we certainly are reaching out to Representative Harper. But his bill is a small piece of the greater measure that we're trying to introduce, and I would just want to state that clearly for the record. This is about super infrastructure from states from, from the northeast and uh, east coast all the way over to the issue I mentioned in California. There are major critical issues that are costing us not only dollars, but certainly challenge our public uh, health and safety. Ms. Eshoo has a question. You're yielding. Oh. Gentleman from New Jersey, time. So I yield to the gentlewoman from California. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to ask um, uh, the uh, chairman of the committee, what's the problem with what Mr. Um, Tonko is uh, proposing well the the question here is germaneness uh, on the subject matter uh, I, see. I i think based on the, the small but is there a, the is unscripted there, colloquy between mr shimkus and mr tomko that we is there we can, is fact, there an intention is there an intention to uh seriously work on it so that it will be germane so that it can be brought back up or is it well, again, we only we only saw this amendment uh, this morning. Uh -huh. So what didn't come up in the in the subcommittee, and that's for the quick question. The, when it was run through the parls uh, uh, across the street, they did they did cite that it was not germane to the bill. Well, since you're just getting to look at it, I I just don't have the feeling that there's a seriousness about a commitment to work this out so that it will be germane. This is a big issue for all of would us. The, would the gentleman yield? It's my time. Look, let me just say this. I didn't want to have a vote on the germaneness uh, because I don't really know whether it's germane or not. I think what we'd like to see, and Ms. Eshoo pointed out, is if we could get, maybe I could just ask you, Mr. Chairman, uh, directly, that if we can get a commitment that we will work together on this whole infrastructure issue that that Mr. Tonko is bringing up because it is an important issue, obviously, not only in the context of, uh, of um, safe drinking water and in general, but specifically with regard to the infrastructure issue. If we can just get a commitment that we will address this, that we'll talk about it more, and we'll take it up seriously. I, I think we'd like, if the gentleman yield, I think we'd yes. be delighted to have a, a number of discussions. We only saw the amendment this morning at 8 o'clock. Uh, so, um, not a problem to, to have discussions, and, and I know that Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Harper, Mr. Tomko, um, be delighted to, to see that opportunity okay. arise. I um, I will withdraw the amendment with the commitment that we will sit down and work on this, and also with the awareness that the feds have reduced their commitment to states, local governments on the revenue 
that is required to maintain these systems. So uh, with that stated and with the commitment made here publicly yeah. to continue to work on the issue, I'll withdraw the amendment. Continue to have this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So with that, the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, are there further amendments to the bill? Mr. Chairman. There are a couple. Gentleman from California, I see, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have an amendment at the desk? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to the committee print for H.R. 212 offered by Mr. McNerney of California. Mr. The, Chairman. The, uh, Mr. Harper. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order against the amendment. Point of order is reserved, and the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank the bill's authors, Mr. Lada, uh, Ms. Miller, Mr. Quigley, and Ms. Kaptur for their advocacy on this issue of clean and safe drinking water. I'm glad that this legislation will be moving forward. The Safe Drinking Water Act was established to protect health by regulating the nation's drinking water supply. This, miss this mission hasn't changed, but new elements and activities threaten our water supplies, including climate change, drought, algae blooms, and other factors. Over the past few years, more and more Western states, including California, have been stricken by drought conditions. Droughts impact the people in many different ways. Water and energy prices increase. Agricultural production suffers. And access to critical resources becomes more challenging. Droughts can be a cause of algal blooms. When the water levels drop, nutrient levels uh, and concentrations rise, which feed algae. So this is uh, a germane issue. It's an issue, drought is an issue that affects and uh, feeds, uh, feeds uh, algal blooms. Now California is entering its fourth year of drought, and we've seen the consequences of not adequately... Mr. Chairman, the committee's not in order. Gentleman is correct. Thank you. Gentleman will Sorry. continue. California is entering its fourth year of drought, and we've seen the consequences of not adequately preparing for water shortages and infrastructure system needs. My amendment directs the EPA to develop a strategic plan for assessing and managing risks of drought to drinking water provided by public water systems, including the risk of algae blooms to safe drinking water. It also establishes guidance around analytical methods and ways in which to protect drinking water as it becomes limited due to drought conditions. Mr. Chairman, I want to see the efforts of this bill succeed in protecting drinking water. I'd like to uh, thank my colleague, Ms. Masui, for co-sponsoring this amendment, uh, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there members wishing to speak on the amendment? General lady from California, Ms. Capps. I take the last word. And I strongly support, uh, thank you, I strongly support the McNerney Amendment. This amendment strengthens the underlying bill by helping us prepare our water systems for all the problems they face, not just harmful algal blooms. Droughts pose many serious problems for the safety and availability of drinking water, and we are unfortunately woefully unprepared to properly address these problems. For example, there's a lake in my district, Lake Kachuma, which is the primary source of drinking water for the Santa Barbara area. This lake is quickly being depleted due to the ongoing California drought, and the water level is currently expected to drop below the gravity-fed intake tunnels by April or May. That is a very short time from now. To ensure local residents could continue getting water, the Kachuma Operation and Maintenance Board had to build an emergency pumping system to get the water into the system once water levels drop below the intake tunnels. The project received a $2 million grant from the state and additional grants from the Bureau of Reclamation to pay $300,000 worth of electrical costs for this. But to date, this project has cost a total of $4.3 million. This is just one example of the multitude of problems our drinking water systems will face as droughts become more frequent and severe due to climate change. Water will need to be conserved, recycled, and treated differently as droughts become more frequent and severe because of this cause. And that's why this amendment is so important. Creating a comprehensive assessment of the threats to safe drinking water pools posed by drought 
will help the EPA and local communities we represent better prepare for the future. It's also important to note that mitigating and adapting to these threats will require significant infrastructure funding similar to what's happening at my Lake Kachuma. In addition to developing strategic plans, we should also be authorizing additional funding for the State Revolving Fund and other federal infrastructure programs to help our local communities actually implement these strategies. A strategic plan is worthless if it just sits on a shelf due to a lack of funding to implement it. So EPA needs additional resources to help our local communities prepare for the evolving and growing threats to our water systems. I will soon be reintroducing legislation to help provide these resources, and I know that Mr. McNearney, Mr. Tunkel, and other of our colleagues have also have bills to address these water infrastructure issues as well. So, Mr. Chairman, I hope H.R. 212 is just the beginning of a more comprehensive effort by this committee to address the entirety of what I believe is a very serious problem. Adopting the McNearney Amendment would be a good step in this direction. I urge my colleagues to support it. I yield back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Mr. Tom Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to strike the last word. Um, as I stated earlier, uh, drinking water is not something we can do without, and um, I think the effort here by Mr. McNerney uh, is an improvement to the, uh, the bill under consideration. When water sources are drawn down, it's proven that the problems of obtaining and treating drinking water increase. Salinity, suspended solids, and other contaminants can uh, be more concentrated and therefore harder to remove from our given water supplies. Given the large area of our nation that is experiencing drought, I believe we really need to uh, support this amendment because we need to better understand this risk and to have better ways to manage it. So um, I speak in support of the amendment by Mr. McNerney. And I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Does the gentleman from Mississippi insist on this point of order? Mr. Chairman, I regret I must insist on the point of order. Uh, the amendment violates Clause 7 of Rule 16 of the Rules of the House because it is not germane to the underlying bill. No. Gentlemen, insists on his point of order. Are there any members wishing to speak briefly on the point of order? Chair is prepared to rule in support of the point of order. Does the uh, gentleman from California wish to rule? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I just want to reiterate that uh, drought causes a reduction in, in water levels and increase in the uh, concentration of nutrients, which do feed algal bloom. So uh, I feel it's in order, but um, I'll let the chair decide on that. Well, I, I'll, I'll note that we did check with the parliamentarians, and they confirmed that, in fact, it is, um, it is subject to a point of order. So do you want me to uh, – so as the gentleman noted, Mississippi Clause 7 of rule, se rule 16 of the Rules of the House prohibits the committee from considering non-germane amendments. The precedents of the House set forth several general tests for germaneness. They include the fundamental purpose test, the jurisdiction test, and the subject matter test. And having reviewed the amendment, uh, the chair finds that the amendment does violate that with respect to the underlying bill. Therefore, the chair sustains the, the point of order. Mr. So, Chairman, may I be recognized? The gentleman is recognized. All right, Mr. Chairman, I will go ahead and withdraw this, but I ask the chairman's uh, indulgence in working to find a way to include the effects of drought, uh, especially in, in that they do uh, feed algae blooms. Uh, I know that it is an issue, particularly in California, and um, uh, I think we might have some joint jurisdiction with the Natural Resources Committee, but I uh, enjoy work, talking and listening and, and seeing if we, there might be a, a way that we can move together. Mr. Chairman, could I um, um, strike the last word a minute? Um, I wanted to point out, you know, we had a discussion with Mr. Shimkus earlier. As you know, when we had the, the subcommittee markup on this, I guess it was earlier this week or last week, um, I made the point that you were working, and Mr. Shimkus was working uh, with, um, with Mr. Tonko in trying to include some democratic amendments uh, in this bill, and they were included, and I do appreciate the fact that, um, that, the, that the chairman and the ranking member of the subcommittee were working together, and that was accomplished. Um, but as you can see, uh, we have several amendments today that, you know, we think have to be addressed and that go to issues that, 
you know, we didn't negotiate an agreement on. And, you know, as, as Mr. Shimkus knows, I, I was concerned at the time that even though we did follow regular order, we went right from a, a hearing uh, to a markup, you know, the same day. So I would ask that with all of these amendments that are going to come up, I think that in every case here we're going to have amendments that are probably going to be declared non-germane and that, you know, the members are going to withdraw them. But I would ask that in each case, uh, given the fact that we didn't have a lot of time since last week, uh, that we would take some time uh, before we go to the floor and uh, either in the context of this bill or further down the road uh, that we uh, have some uh, further discussions and try to accommodate uh, and deal with these issues. Because I think every one of these issues, starting with the infrastructure issue, is something that, you know, over the next, uh, during this session, we should be dealing with. So if I could just get the chairman's well, I, I just, agreement. If the gentleman yield, I, it is an, uh, an unusual practice that we uh, had last week where we went right from the hearing uh, to the markup. Uh, there are lots of extenuating circumstances, uh, not only with Washington being shut down for uh, the weather, Wise, we had the prayer breakfast, a whole number of different. That is not going to be our normal practice, and uh, it's. And so, you know, that. under that, and again, I know that Mr. Shimkus worked hard with Mr. Tonko to try to incorporate some Democratic amendments, and they were incorporated. Yeah. But we do have these additional ones that we're going to raise today. Uh, they're all going to be withdrawn, or they're, and I think if we could just continue to talk about these issues over the next uh, few weeks or month, uh, you know, we certainly would appreciate that because they are important. They, they are, I, I recognize that, and there's, you know, not, as I look at the members of the committee, they're not two finer gentlemen than Mr. Tomko and Mr. Shimkus. Uh, the, the solid relationship that they have together, uh, we, we appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with that, the amendment is uh, withdrawn. Are there further amendments to the bill? General lady from California, Ms. Capps. Amendment at the desk? Amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to the committee print for H.R. 212 offered by Mrs. Capps of California after Section 2 add the following new section. Section 3, Amendment to the Safe Drinking Water Act relating Mr. to... Mr. Chairman, I, have, I reserve a point of order against point, the amendment. Point of order is reserved. The uh, ask unanimous consent that the, uh, the title of the amendment be read. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and as uh, policymakers, as you know, we have a responsibility to, to create the policies, policies that advocate the best interests of current and future generations. Ensuring that everyone has access to safe, clean, and abundant drinking water is one such responsibility. My amendment would simply add a new section at the end of the bill requiring EPA to develop a strategic plan for assessing and managing the risks of climate change to drinking water. The language is very similar to that of the underlying bill and would in no way hinder EPA's ability to re develop its harmful algal bloom strategy. In fact, my amendment would strengthen the underlying bill by requiring EPA to examine the full array <coughs> of environmental factors that contribute to harmful algal blooms. Water temperature, salinity, and nutrient availability all dictate where and when the algal species responsible for these blooms thrive and survive. And the expected changes in these environmental factors due to climate change will likely increase the frequency, the duration, timing, and intensity of harmful algal blooms. For example, it's well documented that algal blooms most often occur in warm waters, primarily during summer months. It's also well documented that climate change can contribute to warmer waters and longer summers, thus increasing the number of potentially harmful blooms in the future. Climate change is also predicated, predicted to alter the frequency and severity of droughts and severe storms. Changes to evaporation and precipitation patterns can make fresh water around the country saltier, which supports the survival of certain harmful algal species that have higher tolerances to salinity. Intense rainfall can also increase nutrient runoff into water bodies, which can lead to faster algal, algae growth and more harmful algal blooms. This problem is exacerbated when intense storms are followed by periods of drought, which has been seen around the country, including in the Great Lakes and along the East Coast. In addition to altering the timing, duration, and severity of harmful algal blooms, climate change also poses several other threats to safe drinking water and public health. Rising sea levels, for example, threaten coastal water systems through saltwater intrusions, and increasing 
flood, flooding from stronger storms and sea level rise can cripple drinking water systems that are not adequately prepared. The threats to safe drinking water posed by climate change are diverse and they are serious. And we do have a responsibility to help communities mitigate them. My amendment would simply direct EPA to look at all these threats to drinking water safety rather than just a narrow piece of the puzzle. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 212 is a well-intentioned bill and I commend its authors for the bipartisan effort. One of the strengths of the bill is that it relies on the best available science to develop a strategic plan. But if we trust scientists to assess the threat of harmful algal blooms to our drinking water, we should also trust them to assess any and all threats that they deem relevant, including climate change. We can't pick and choose what science we want to believe or pay attention to. Like it or not, science tells us that safe drinking water is threatened by both harmful algal blooms and climate change. We owe it to our constituents to respect the science and do everything we can to make sure that our folks have safe water to drink now and in the future. My amendment would help achieve this goal, and I urge my colleagues to adopt it. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Mr. Tomko. Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word. I um, stand in support of the uh, CAPS amendment. I applaud Representative CAPS for providing the sort of thoughtfulness about climate change as it relates to this legislation. Climate change poses a real risk both to sources of water and to water infrastructure. The recent large hurricanes that swept through the Gulf Coast and the Northeast showed how vulnerable drinking water systems are to these events. I've seen it in my district. Increased drought poses risk for some areas, while flooding poses risk for other areas. Temperature changes also increase some pollution problems. With harmful algal blooms, for example, may they may become more prevalent. They like warm water. If we understand the risks and act now to make our drinking water systems more resilient and resistance resistant to these risks, we will save money and be ready for the changes we face. So I fully stand in support of this amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Chair. I recognize the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I ask that we oppose this amendment and, and just kind of remind people that H H.R. 212 creates a strategic plan to tackle the biological phenomenon of harmful algae growth in source water and to shore up information gaps that EPA has on harmful algal blooms. It is intentionally not prescriptive because it does not prejudge the answers. Shouldn't the focus be on how we deal with cyanotoxins in the water source used for drinking water? The risk of trying to make this bill do everything for everybody is that it could wind up being nothing for anybody, leaving harmful algal blooms right outside the intake of some drinking water utility pipes. So I appreciate my colleagues and friends. I understand their concerns. I appreciate their passion. Uh, the bill is really designed to be a directive to identify this problem uh, that happened in Ohio. Uh, in a bipartisan manner along with uh, Bob Lada and Marcy Kaptur. And my fear is if we add and bolt on all these additional issues, uh, we will not get it to the floor. The gentleman yield? I will. Uh, you know, the gentleman, I understand the gentleman. I know that, you know, Ms. Kaptur is uh, one of the, you know, main people that's also pushing for this legislation. And I understand that, um, again, this is something locally that needs to be addressed. Uh, but, you know, you have to understand that the issue of, and I'm sure you do, that the issue of climate change uh, is not only something that we as Democrats care very much about, but that we, not only here in the committee, but in, I also believe in the House as a whole, uh, feel has not been addressed. And that, you know, many, as you know, many Republicans, I'm not speaking for yourself, but there are many Republicans who feel that it's an issue that doesn't even exist, at least in terms of human impact which many of us disagree with. So I think you have to understand that we are going to continue to raise the issue of climate change whenever we think it's appropriate to bring up. I mean, I, when we had our organizational meeting uh, of the committee, I raised it and I tried to get it into the organizational plan, which I knew that would be defeated. But it is a major issue for us that impacts almost everything that we do in this committee, not even just in the, the subcommittee uh, that Mr. Tonko was the ranking member of. So I understand you want to move this bill uh, again, you know, due to germaneness 
or whatever, we, you know, these amendments will be withdrawn. But understand that we feel very strongly that the issue of climate change does have to be addressed, uh, not only in this committee, but in the House as a whole. And we are going to continue to raise it. Uh, in my own district, uh, as, as Mr. Tonko mentioned, you know, I was the district that was hit most by Superstorm uh, Sandy. And we still haven't recovered from it over two years later. And it had impacts in everything, drinking water, uh, utilities, plants. Everything was impacted. So it's hard to find an issue uh, that does not um, uh, have some relationship to uh, climate change. I yield back. I, I, reclaiming the, the, my time, I would just say I remember a, yank, uh, a young ranking member on the Health Subcommittee who kept harassing his chairman about having hearings on a particular subject. So uh, I appreciate those comments. Chairman yields back. Other members wishing to speak? Gentleman lady from California. I don't want to cut off anyone else uh, from who wants to speak, but I know I understand that there's probably going to be a, a point of order against this amendment. And in anticipation of that, <laughs> I'm, I'm prepared to withdraw it. But it doesn't, if I could just make one comment, it doesn't make the problem go away in many of our drought stricken areas. And so I would ask for assurances from the chairman uh, that this uh, topic will be addressed and that we will continue to look for ways that we can respond that are effective and meaningful to our constituents. Uh, let me just, if the gentlelady will yield, I know that we're looking, all looking forward to the administrator of EPA coming to testify here shortly, and I'm sure that we'll have lots of questions uh, on the issues that are being raised today with the, with the amendments. Uh, does the gentleman insist on this point of order? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. He this does. And before the chair rules, the, the author wish to withdraw the amendment? I'm, will, I'm willing he to does. withdraw it. The amendment is withdrawn. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seen a uh, gentleman from Maryland. At the desk. I do, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to the committee print for H.R. 212 offered by Mr. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. The clerk will read uh, uh, the, the title of the amendment. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is being offered uh, to require the Environmental Protection Agency to develop a strategic plan for assessing and managing drinking water related risks associated with hydraulic uh, fracturing operations. The practice of hydraulic fracturing, which has become quite pervasive now, um, is having a significant positive impact on our energy security. We know that. But the regulation of fracking has not kept pace with that, and there are concerns about the impact it has on drinking water. As it happens, EPA is currently working on a study of the drinking water impacts of fracking. That study, which we expect to be completed this spring, will outline the mechanisms by which fracking impacts drinking water supplies. Because of EPA's extensive work preparing that study, we know already that there are impacts at all stages of the fracking process. At the beginning of the process, there are significant amounts of water which are drawn from aquifers which potentially impacts drinking water supplies. At the end of the process, there are large amounts of wastewater um, that are sent for disposal, potentially overwhelming wastewater treatment works and dumping pollution into our surface waters. And of course, throughout the process um, of fracking, uh, the fracking itself and surface spills of fracking fluids, which we've seen occur, do pose some serious risks. Um, there's long been as well an absence of real transparency around what chemicals fracking companies are mixing and injecting into our ground, but we know that many of them do pose risk to drinking water. I want to I emphasize I support this bill, the underlying bill, um, which pairs assessment and management of drinking water impacts. For fracking, EPA has been hard at work on the assessment side, as I, as I indicated, but doesn't have in place a strategic plan to manage the drinking water impacts that have been or will be identified. Um, that's why I'm offering the amendment to ensure an effective response uh, to protect uh, public health. Um, I do want to mention that 
The Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, which I and other members whose districts intersect with it, um, jealously seek to protect, um, the footprint of that watershed is New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Delaware. The footprint of the Marcellus Shale deposit is New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, um, and Maryland. Uh, so you have almost a complete overlap of the watershed and the Marcellus Shale deposit, which means it's really critical that we understand what negative impacts can come from fracking, uh, particularly in the region that I'm speaking about. Uh, so this is a common sense uh, opportunity for us to get the kind of management of the impacts of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water. And I think that if you sat with certainly any one of my constituents, and I think the average citizen out there, and said, uh, the EPA is doing this study. They're going to determine what the impacts of fracking are on drinking water. Um, and we think it's a good idea to have a strategic plan in place to manage those risks and potential harms going forward. They would say that's absolutely a common sense uh, thing to do uh, and would support it. And for that reason, I urge my colleagues to vote yes on the amendment. And I yield back. Other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to strike the last word. Um, to address the issue of protecting our water supplies, it needs to be holistic. And this is yet another issue that needs to be addressed uh, in terms of the hydro, uh, hydraulic fracturing that. Uh, Representative Sarbanes is introduced here in form of an amendment. In New York State, we currently have a ban on fracking. And this issue is and has been highly controversial in my state where water resources are highly valued. When this committee granted an exception to the Safe Drinking Water Act for the shale gas industry, they set up this controversy. I believe the representative, uh, Representative Sarbanes, is attempting to address that, uh, that exemption. Even in my home state of New York, where water regulation is very strong, the public does not trust that the industry necessarily will protect their water. So where there are risks, we need to deal with them. I strongly support this, uh, this effort, the amendment that addresses hydro hydraulic fracturing and uh, yield back. This gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman insist on his point of order? He's doing this. Yes, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, um, Mr. Chairman, um, on the point of order, um, I, I gather the, the, the objection can be based on jurisdiction or subject matter and so forth, and I'm obviously not a parliamentarian. I know there's a ruling coming um, there could one at, be one. at your insistence. But um, I, I would just say this. If, if you said to the average person um, who's turning their tap on and expecting clean water to come out of it, um, we decided to focus on the impacts that X, Y, and Z have on whether that water is drinkable, but we, we didn't look at A, B, and C. They would say, well, that seems to be all part of the same subject matter as far as I'm concerned. I just want to know that if the water goes into this glass and I drink it, I'm going to be okay. And I understand that's not the pol parliamentary standard, perhaps, but just looking at it from the point of view of the average citizen out there, um, I think that's important to note. Um, and I would say I'm prepared to withdraw um, the amendment based on the, uh, the parliamentary objection uh, on germaneness. Yeah. But um, I would encourage the committee going forward, and hopefully the chairman will support this, um, to uh, take a closer look at these impacts on drinking water um, of hydraulic fracturing, particularly since um, we are going to have a good study from the Environmental Protection Agency, and it would be kind of a, a waste uh, when we receive that study um, and the public receives it, not to know that there's a strategic plan in place for managing the risks that it identifies uh, going forward. So hopefully that's a discussion the committee can continue to have. With that, if, I would... I'm if the gentleman yield, the, um, so this bill is focused on certain living organisms, of which fracking is not. So, uh, but I, again, as I indicated in the, on the last amendment, we are looking forward to having Administrator McCarthy here uh, in a couple weeks. Yes. And I'm sure that this is going to be an extensive subject, and we're going to make sure that it's hopefully not on a getaway day so that we'll be able to have her for an extended period of time for questions on both sides of the aisle. Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me go first to Mr. Pallone and then Mr. Shimkus. 
I don't know who has the time, but I just I want to say I know again the germaneness is here. I mean, I don't know whether it's the case or not, but I know that the gentleman is going to withdraw his uh, amendment. But like climate change, um, fracking obviously is a major issue that you know comes under the jurisdiction of the subcommittee in particular in this case de dealing with drinking water or in many other respects, uh, not only for the subcommittee but for the committee as a whole. And you know, when I go home, um, this is what people talk about. They're concerned about climate change. They're concerned about fracking and the impacts. Our municipalities, our state legislatures are all dealing with this in various ways. So again, I think that I understand that we're taking this up in the context of this particular bill, and this bill is going to move forward without it. But I do think that this is an issue that we need to address and you know discuss uh, in a larger sense. Uh, in this committee uh, over the next few weeks or the next few months. So I appreciate the fact that the gentleman from Maryland is raising it at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be quick. Uh, the, regular author the regulatory authority is held with the state on the fracking issue. That's why New York has been able to ban it. And while other states have passed rules and regulations, that Illinois has a very aggressive regulatory regime. In fact, they haven't even permitted any fracking, led by a Democrat governor and a Democrat legislature. So I think that's another debate of who actually has the authority. Now, some will say we should be national authority, but of course, we would say we should be held with the states. Well, the gentleman yield? I would just be. I would. Um, very fair point, and obviously there are states that are being more aggressive uh, than others. Yeah. Maryland, um, as, as does New York, has a, a moratorium in place uh, right now. But getting back to the watershed, you know, these rivers know no state boundaries. It's not like um, some contaminant coming up to the Maryland state border uh, from Pennsylvania decides to stop there, comes through the Susquehanna watershed. And when you look at it through the watershed lens, you understand that there's a regional dimension to this uh, that can really only be managed uh, by having the kind of oversight that can be provided by a federal agency. Um, like the Environmental Protection Agency. So I hope we have that discussion uh, going forward, just so we don't frustrate the efforts of the states to do the right thing, but states are next to each other and they're impacted by what happens upstream, um, certainly. And I'll yield back. Chair would recognize Chairman. Gen General Lady from California. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, uh, several excellent points have been made, uh, both in terms of the uh, regulatory um, responsibilities uh, in the states, uh, but also what is happening all around this issue. Uh, I would venture to say that probably more than half of the full committee um, uh, maybe um, have really never uh, done a deep dive on the issue. And I think that it deserves, uh, there are some that know a lot, there are some that know very little, uh, but I think that the, uh, the full committee um, really needs to be informed on this uh, because it's, it, it is an issue that is, um, uh, is right out there. Uh, it's, it's, it's wedded to um, uh, one part, uh, a major part of it, of, uh, of our country becoming uh, independent of foreign oil. Uh, and, uh, and our energy supplies. Uh, but that's not the only part of it. So what I'm asking you, Mr. Chairman, is to make a commitment that there's a hearing on this. This should really have a thorough um, uh, examination. And after that thorough examination, uh, members, as we always do, uh, we draw uh, a great deal from the witnesses that come in, and including the lead agency, uh, and then people can make up their minds uh, about where the facts take them. But uh, this is large enough, important enough, uh, for this important committee to have a hearing on it. So I I'm asking that, uh, uh, that you uh, begin to put that in place and work with the, uh, uh, the subcommittee and the uh, Chair, uh, uh, chairs it and, the, and yeah. the ranking member. I think it deserves that kind of attention. Chair, I'll reclaim his time. Uh, again, I know that I know this is an issue that it's going to be raised when EPA comes. Uh, I will recall well an amendment that was prepared for the House floor and uh, uh, at the urgence of some Democratic leaders, the amendment was not offered on the House floor, knowing what its result was going to be. So um, we'll, we'll come back.
to this, let me just, uh, again, I was asking if the, the point of order was going to be insisted upon. Uh, with that, I might just uh, yield uh, to Mr. Flores. And Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the uh, amendment is not withdrawn or if their point of order is not sustained, I'll have multiple comments. But I think the record should reflect a 360-degree view of the practice of hydraulic fracturing. So I'm going to keep this very brief uh, since we have the, the point of order pending or potential withdrawal. The allegations made about hydraulic fracturing are not correct that you've heard in the record so far. But I, and, I, and that's been substantiated by every admin, Obama administration uh, person, administrator, or official who has testified before Congress for the last six years. And so I think it's important that the record reflect that. This is a solution in search of a problem. Uh, if it does come up, we can have a more robust discussion later on. Thank you. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, my time has expired. Gentleman insists on his point of order. Yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I uh, insist prior on the to order. ruling, does the yeah, gentleman Ms. wish Mr. to Jer withdraw? Chairman, prior to ruling, I will um, I'll withdraw the uh, the amendment, but hope that the committee will give it the attention that's been been requested. I think we'll today. be Thanks. looking forward to that. Uh, amendment is withdrawn. Are there further amendments to the bill? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady is recognized. Does she have an amendment to the bill? The, the clerk will report the title of the bill, of the Amend amendment, rather. Amendment to the committee print for H.R. 212. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order against point the amendment. Point of order is reserved, and the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Amendment. Chairman. I offer the amendment to H.R. Uh, 2012, the Clark Amendment, otherwise known as uh, the Drinking Water Protection Act, this amendment is based on drinking water security bill that was passed in the House in the 111th Congress. The bill was a product of a bipartisan negotiation and collaboration between this committee and the Committee on Homeland Security. And while we are speaking to naturally occurring phenomena with the scope of this bill, ensuring the safety and security of America's drinking water is a paramount concern to all members here today. H.R. 212 critically addresses the risk posed by particular contaminants that may make their way into drinking, the drinking water supply. Indeed, while it is critical to ana analyze the effects of toxins and for the Environmental Protection Agency to draw up a plan to mitigate these risks, it is equally important to guarantee the security of water systems uh, infrastructure. This amendment will enhance our homeland security improving protections for employees, neighbors, and local communities while ensuring the continued delivery of clean and safe drinking water. Through this important amendment, the EPA will help to identify and assess vulnerabilities in the covered water systems. Identifying these vulnerabilities can help mitigate not only naturally occurring phenomena, but just as importantly, uh, intentional acts of sabotage. It is a time to finally close the security gap with such profound consequences for our communities living around drinking water facilities and beyond. That is why I'm offering this amendment to H.R. 212 and ask my colleagues to join me in support. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. Did you want time? Uh, Chair would recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Cologne. Thank you. And, and again, uh, I want to uh, thank the gentlewoman from New York for raising this very important issue, regardless of you know what we end up doing with the amendment today. Um, I certainly support it, and you know she's from New York, uh, but if you look at the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area, uh, we have I don't know I'm going to venture to guess who 20 million people uh, concentrated in a relatively small area, and. Um, there's a tremendous amount of concern at home about, you know, the impact if there was some kind of terrorist attack or some other effort to contaminate drinking water. So the whole issue of security uh, in the context of drinking water is, is, is really uh, so important because in the wrong hands, uh, you know, dangerous chemicals or other intentional terrorist acts could really uh, have a terrible impact on our whole population. So I just want to say once again, again, I know this is going to be withdrawn, but this is something that we definitely need to address and is, you know, within the scope, obviously, of the subcommittee and the full committee. So thank you again. Chair, would recognize Mr. Shimkus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want, you know, for the record, um, I think it's 
not accurate to portray this as a bipartisan bill. If you go into the uh, yeah. the record of the dissenting opinions, it's pretty clear that uh, there was a lot of dissent on this bill. So. Uh, um, again, we want to focus on the narrow scope of this language. This actually makes it way beyond its means, and we look forward to working with people in the future. Yield back. Chairman yields back. This gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to strike the last word. I want to thank my colleague, Representative Clark, for her very thoughtful amendment. Both of us hailing from the state of New York understand what intentional attack can mean. Uh, we witnessed that through the devastation of 9-11 and uh, know that there are uh, great impacts that can be felt by communities. Uh, security, physical, physical security and cyber security are vital to our uh, critical infrastructure systems. Drinking water is certainly one of those critical systems. This is another area where the federal government should be a strong partner with state and local governments and with water utilities to ensure the continued safety of our drinking water supplies. An accident or an intentional attack on these resources is something we hope never to face. Prevention and certainly preparation are the best ways to ensure that we never do. So with that, I, um, move, I support the, uh, the amendment by Representative Clark and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman still insist on this point of order? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I uh, insist on the point of order. Uh, the amendment violates uh, Clause 7 of Rule 16 of the Rules of the House because it's not germane to the underlying bill. Before the Chair rules, does the gentlelady wish to withdraw her amendment? Mr. Chairman, I, I will withdraw the amendment. Uh, however, I, I want us to uh, recognize that uh, we're missing an opportunity here to really uh, address a, a gap um, in the work that we're doing. Um, the concern of our, our, our drinking water uh, is... is both biological and intentional, and uh, we need to be very cognizant of that, um, as has been stated by my colleagues here on this side of the aisle. But I do withdraw, Mr. General Lady withdraws her amendment. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 212 to the House. All those in favor will say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably reported. Without objection, staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the bills reported by the committee today, so ordered. And without objection, the committee stands adjourned.